Welcome to the webinar Fast Track Kubernetes on VMware. My name is Fran Schubert. I work at Giant Swarm together with customers around their strategies, how they uh, want to adopt cloud native technologies and move on that journey very quickly. And I've got uh, Javi Avrilly here with me, who is our VMware expert and uh, has been working together uh, with these technologies for a very long time. Um, and uh, he'll be showing real life um, examples of uh, what we've done with customers on VMware and uh, what it looks like. Um, so this will be an exciting session. Um, great to have you, Xavi, and uh, looking forward to uh, the content. Yeah, thank you for having me. So um, what I like about webinars is that um, you get uh, experts like Xavi share you know, his knowledge and experience, um, but then you also have uh, like people from me <laughs> who basically come in and, uh, and consult a lot um, uh, with customers around uh, their strategies is um, to, to enable uh, the listeners to take a step back and look at what they've been doing, what they're trying to achieve, and uh, reconsider if the approach that they've chosen is the right approach. And uh, this is something that I, would, uh, I love doing um, uh, because it helps widening the, uh, the view um, of uh, the listeners. And I hope uh, you're all joining me and taking that step back and uh, taking a look at the environment that you need to operate in. Um, and to do that, I thought of um, you know a couple of factors that um, basically put a lot of pressure on the infrastructure teams today. There's nothing much new on these slides, but I would like to highlight um, a couple of areas um, and uh, ask you to assess yourself where you are and uh, if uh, uh, the strategies that you've chosen um, really put you on a, a great pressure or give you freedom to operate. Um, and my idea here is, together with Xavier, to show you different options uh, that you have in these areas um, to take a look at and uh, consider how you want to move forward with them. One aspect, naturally, is uh, to reduce cost. It's uh, the top priority for all our companies right now with uh, all this uncertainty uh, going forward in the market. Um, with uh, naturally the consumers uh, being very hesitant after COVID and uh, the energy high, uh, spikes uh, to invest money, to spend money, um, to uh, then basically predict where everything is going and uh, how much money you can spend now. So everyone is trying to uh, contain uh, the money they have and uh, really make sure that uh, they can survive a long period of time without um, you know, a major um, benefits from the market. At the same time, naturally, everyone is looking for more money. Um, VMware has increased prices quite significantly over the last year, I heard. Uh, the Broadcom acquisition will not uh, make that remove, so um, this will probably um, uh, continue uh, and bite into your uh, budget and infrastructure budget. Uh, but uh, I think most importantly, uh, we also see a big trend in uh, cloud adoption. And that makes it very difficult for on-prem environments uh, where some parts stay on-prem, but uh, the majority goes into the cloud um, and also the budgets go into the cloud to make uh, on-prem still um, you know, a viable model. And uh, this is something where the more naturally goes to the cloud, the more difficult it gets uh, and the more expensive it gets for all those remaining on-prem. So um, that's where you know we believe uh, an approach that Javier will be sharing uh, later is you know where you use um, a very bare minimum abstraction layer um, from the uh, technology um, and that's where uh, cost API comes in um, where you adapt that to the clouds but then basically abstract away everything on top uh, making sure that you can reuse whatever you develop for the cloud or on-prem uh, vice versa um, and then uh, that's where uh, as an option, you then would uh, be able to advance very, very quickly in both areas. The more you use um, uh, yeah, proprietary technology and uh, proprietary approaches, uh, the more difficult it gets to uh, make uh, this cost uh, bridge uh, or the, the cost gap bridge. So that's the cost aspect. The other element which ties into cloud is that you know actually the, the software development teams are getting more mature. They're used to cloud technologies. Um, this is where uh, they are used to self service. They're used to uh, you know using all kinds of stuff and expect the same from on prem. And I think this is something where um, yeah you will 
be put into a more and more pressure to um, not only support the requirements, um, but uh, also to manage and govern that across uh, on-prem and cloud, um, and uh, also make sure that uh, that governance aspect uh, uh, is fully automated to also enable self-service. So uh, basically, that's where you've got these um, uh, you know, approaches like GitOps um, and uh, the whole um, um, deployment pipeline that you can use um, to basically administer and manage and govern uh, both on-prem and cloud environment from a central place. Um, and this is also something that uh, Javier will be diving into a little bit more in the future. So this would be another possibility for you to um, basically fend off um, any support requirements that uh, might be overloading your team. Nothing is as constant as change. I think that's where we uh, basically see that you need to adapt to change. Um, you've seen that uh, in Kubernetes uh, that uh, over the lifetime has seen different um, technologies uh, side by side uh, compete to be the orchestration engine. I think um, it's very clear that Kubernetes um, has won that race and um, is becoming the de facto standard. Um, there are a lots of um, let's say technology evolutions in that space. Um, the whole CNCF um, portfolio is full of uh, open source apps that evolve at a rapid pace and need to get replaced um, either because they're acquired or they change the license model or you know, another technology becomes um, uh, more prevalent. Um, so this is where uh, we see a lot of uh, change happening. Some other aspect, a non-technology aspect, is that uh, we also see a lot of fluctuation in the market uh, from uh, the employee perspective. I don't know how it's with your uh, company, but uh, I've just read this week that uh, the average tenure of a uh, software engineer is uh, about two years. Um, so you need to make sure that whatever you do to um, adapt uh, the technology to your proprietary environment, to your specific networking, whatever, needs to then be productized and made sure that uh, that knowledge gets shared um, because you don't want to make yourself liable to um, a single custom implementation that someone needs to, uh, needs to support. So this is where you need to go forward and think about how to adapt to change. And um, one element I think that that's we clearly can show up is that um, as Giant Swarm, we um, always have um, considered ourselves a product that is fully supported and managed uh, by ourselves. And uh, this is where we um, yeah, uh, also drive uh, any extensions to the open source technology into the open source community and upstream uh, projects. Um, and Javi also has a nice example for that. Uh, what we've done uh, with cluster API, with uh, VCD, uh, with uh, different uh, networks. And uh, yeah, and be able to show you in that respect. And finally, um, you need to envision what your uh, what your value will be to the organization and how you can deliver that value. Um, so, you know, basically, if you look at the engineering force, uh, the more productive you can make them, the bigger the value for the organization. There's a McKinsey study that says if you can remove any um, any, any nuisance uh, to developers um, uh, and companies that do that, um, basically uh, experience a four to five times bigger revenue growth. Um, so maybe that's uh, kind of something how you want to perceive uh, yourself, not being the ones that where the development teams want to implement something, then they implement it, and I've seen that <laughs> over and over again, where then the development teams throw something over the fence and say, well, you know, infrastructure, please manage that now for me after I've built it up. Um, you want to be the driver. You want to be the ones that set uh, the environment for developers, make it very productive, and anticipate also future use cases and provide that to these um, uh, development teams um, to then basically operate um, uh, and, and, and contribute to the value that um, you, you, you can uh, to the organization. So as you can see, there are different, let's say, pressure points and factors that uh, have an impact on you as an infrastructure team. And uh, from that perspective, um, uh, it's, I think it's very important uh, to think about different strategies that can bring you out and uh, remove uh, these pressures uh, from, from you. Um, and I hope I was able to show you a couple of uh, them. What I also want to do is uh, talk a little bit about why Giant Swarm is the company to speak to you about that. Um, uh, we've been in that situation um, ourselves um, before we founded uh, Giant Swarm. We um, 
uh, developed a data driven ad platform. And uh, at that uh, stage, we had to uh, then come up with a, a infrastructure that would allow us to build our cloud native uh, technologies on. And uh, we ended up, um, you know, with different models. One was where we got open source technology that we managed ourselves, and uh, that required a lot of personnel that we acquired or got licenses for it, a product, uh, but that limited us uh, in our yeah, abilities. We didn't have the impact on uh, the roadmap of that product as much as we would like to have. Um, an additional support was uh, always uh, difficult because, you know, whenever something went down, yes, we could open a ticket, but then it would go back and forth and it'd take ages. So we basically ended up fixing it ourselves. Um, so, you know, there are different uh, ways that whether well, we try to get around this. And um, yeah, uh, once uh, we sold that uh, company successfully, um, we basically decided this is a new era, um, cloud native technology. Everyone's working on this. Uh, you build it, you run it. Um, we want to do it differently. And uh, we started off that company in 2014. In 2015, we um, very early had already adapted Kubernetes as the container orchestration platform which turned out to be a very smart choice. Um, by 2017, uh, we already had um, uh, several customers um, operating 24-7 um, the infrastructure for uh, different uh, mission-critical applications. Amongst them, Adidas, um, the web shop that they, uh, at that time we developed completely, and uh, that grew uh, their revenue for the online shop grew from 40 million to 5 billion uh, within just a few years. So this is uh, yeah, a, a major success story, and it showed that uh, Kubernetes can provide a tremendous value to the organization. We always managed our Kubernetes because we, we knew we would be managing hundreds of Kubernetes clusters for our customers. So we always applied the rule of um, uh, using Kubernetes to manage Kubernetes. Um, and we were very happy when uh, Costa AVI project uh, picked that up. And uh, yeah, we've been a great uh, contributor to the Costa API uh, project. Uh, Javi will talk about this a little bit in a while, uh, where we then cover what Cluster API is and uh, what it means for VMware. Uh, there are two different versions, ones for vSphere, um, ones for a VCD uh, Cloud Cloud Director. So we've got Cavi and Cap VCD. Um, and have contributed tremendously to both projects. Um, we do the same for Cap Z, Cap Pa, Cap uh, G. So um, yeah, for the Amazon, uh, AWS, uh, Azure, and uh, Google providers. Uh, but we don't stop at Kubernetes, and I think this is something that uh, evolved uh, gradually. Is that the value we provide uh, to companies goes way beyond uh, Kubernetes? We already knew we need an environment to manage that for our customers. So we already have observability and connectivity and many elements in there already. Um, and we decided in 2021 that we decide that we expose this to our customers. So give them access. Basically, um, you know, companies can immediately start off with a, a very mature security stack, developer ex experience stack, connectivity, observability, everything there, pure open source, fully managed by giant, uh, by giant swarm. Um, so they can ready, readily use that, but they can also use whatever they already have in place and feel comfortable with. Um, so making sure that that connection is there is something that uh, we ensured. But uh, it allowed us to prepare the next step, which is driving processes and cloud native processes into the organization. And that's what uh, we've been doing, um, started doing this year, where we uh, basically have cloud native developer capabilities that uh, we drive into the organization. So instead of providing just vulnerability scans to developers, we uh, basically make sure we like, you know, why are, are there vulnerabilities identifying the source? Uh, and now we decided to not to look at vulnerabilities, but you know, take that step beforehand. It's like you know, actually, all vulnerability scanners work the same way. They um, they they look at uh, the outdated packages that uh, have been um, uh, and libraries that have been used. Um, so you know, why not inform uh, developers upfront that there are libraries that they need to upgrade um, uh, to and uh, to avoid vulnerabilities? And uh, that's what we've been doing with customers now is driving these processes into the organization. Same for cost reduction, where uh, you can either work together very closely with the development teams, or you can do that centrally, scaling up and scaling down development environments, for example, at night. Um, these aspects have already resulted in 40% uh, cost optimization for our companies. So um, yeah, we um, use a, a very 
elaborate stack on technology for that, but then also work together with the platform teams on uh, these capabilities uh, that forward. And I think uh, the next picture d depicts that very nicely, where you know basically you've got them the the at the core you've got the different cloud providers and on-prem environments where basically you've got a very thin layer of um, you know kind of a connector the cluster API projects that uh, give you access to the different configurations of these uh, cloud accounts and technologies, uh, but then basically you start abstracting away and that's where you've got an integrated open source cluster API multi-cloud fleet management solution that's completely gets up spaced and, um, uh, and and is fully automated so making sure that whatever you know if you want to spin up a cluster on-prem or uh, in uh, aws you basically um set crds the approach is very similar and uh, that connection layer then makes sure that uh, it's uh, converted into the right commands um, on the clouds once you've got that as a basis, you can manage like fleets of clusters very efficiently. You've got the automation in place. You've got the reconciliation in place. You have basically uh, everything in place to, to then automatically check and reconcile uh, the environment that you have. And, uh, and uh, what we then did is we um, extended that with that developer platform where we add apps and make sure that the same technology applies to apps. So you can decide what clusters, what teams, what whatever namespaces get apps, um, have access rights to that, get installed, um, have golden paths ready. So all that is already there. And if you want to do upgrades, if you want to do uh, tear down a cluster, everything is basically taken care of and automated in that um, integrated open source developer platform. And uh, it allows your teams then to utilize these technologies very easily. Um, once we work together with, um, you know, kind of customers, that's where we take care of the 24-7 management, making sure that uh, we've got, um, you know, kind of that constant evolution of the technologies, the testing out new technologies, making sure they're integrated, taking care of 24-7 uh, operations, taking ownership of it. So we make sure that uh, you get back to production and we don't care if it's the cloud provider or if it's our stack or if it's your application. Yes, there are some, uh, some limitations like we don't know your code, but we might be able to use uh, logging and, um, and, and uh, information uh, that is available to us to help you guide where the uh, source and the root cause could be and uh, how to resolve it. Um, and that's where we make sure also that uh, we um, engage with you on a, on a regular basis. And I'll get down to that in just a minute and how we engage with customers, uh, which is uh, something we completely redefined. And the outer layer then is basically how we work together with uh, platform teams, being that extension to the platform teams and having them focus on uh, what are specifics about the company that need to be considered? What are elements, use cases that developers need that you want to provide in a central fashion? What elements are being used frequently across the different teams that you can then provide centrally? How can you um, allow and give access to a self-service environment? So these are all elements where we know there is a, a, a significant degree of customization required, and that's where we work together with the platform team to uh, to build that value add um, that fourth box at the bottom from the first, first slide, if you remember. So this is uh, kind of how we work uh, in general. The idea here is abstract away as much as possible from the developers, provide what they need to, so they can be as productive as possible and help the company grow. And how we work together with uh, customers uh, is that uh, we, um, we've got instant chats, so we've got Slack channel, it's like we work together in the same company. Um, you just ping people. If you want to discuss something, if you've got a problem, if you identify something, just ask questions and we're there to help. Uh, we've got weekly standups where we've got tickets that uh, where we drive the evolution of the platform forward. If there is any issue, we are typically on the spot within one and a half minutes, um, probably even faster than uh, your internal team uh, can do. And it's always the team that, uh, already that developed that solution for you. So basically, um, if there is, uh, you know, something on uh, Camp V, then Camp v, uh, together with his team will be on call and uh, uh, resolve this. It's not a first or second line or whatever. It's always uh, you're talking to the developers immediately because we know how mission critical this is. We ensure that there is a knowledge transfer. We want um, people as smart as us on the other side. <laughs> um, 
uh, especially around cloud native. Uh, that's fun working together with them. And, um, you know, we don't want to hold back any information. That's uh, really great. And that's what people really appreciate. Um, we want to deploy best practices, uh, making sure that whatever worked in one company gets transferred to another company um, and, uh, yeah, and then gets adapted or whatever. But that's where we really drive things forward. And uh, uh, we also drive whatever uh, extensions or uh, customizations there are. We uh, basically try to prioritize that and then drive that into the open source community to make sure that the open source um, uh, projects uh, maintain that going forward. Now, I think I've covered most of what we do and how we do di things differently. I uh, give you a feeling, but um, yeah, um, slides uh, can look uh, daunting. So I'll just hand over to Xavier, who will again explain a little bit of the context, what uh, context, and uh, give you a, a, a live uh, view of, of what things look like. Um, I hope uh, I was able to show you that uh, sometimes uh, it makes sense to reconsider what uh, what do you how you've been doing things, and I'm looking forward to any questions and conversations in the end. Yeah, thank you, Franz. Um, so um, I will be taking over for a slightly more technical overview of our platform. <clears throat> We're going to be talking about um, CapV and CapVCD. So first off, before doing that, I'm going to talk about Cluster API and what it is. Um, so Cluster API, it is a Kubernetes uh, project, so fully open source, of course, uh, contributed by the big company, the big names like Google, VMware, Red Hat. Um, and the point of Cluster API is to be able to declaratively provision Kubernetes clusters using Kubernetes resources. So instead of manually going and connecting to your infrastructure and creating the resources yourself. Um, you will just create custom resources um, by custom resource definitions that are installed by Cluster API and the providers. Um, and then you will have a bunch of providers that will do the work for you. So you're essentially deploying Kubernetes from Kubernetes. Um, which makes things much easier from a cloud native perspective because you have one management cluster, which is your uh, single control plane of glass, let's say, um, and you can control everything from there. Uh, so from your management cluster, you will deploy as many worker clusters as, as you want uh, within the limits of your resources, of course. Um, and you can do that on various different types of infrastructures. Uh, so these are infrastructure provider, we call them. Um, and there's uh, providers for a lot of different platforms. Uh, so AWS, Azure, uh, VMware, vSphere, and vCD. And then there's GCP, OpenStack, uh, you name it, there are a lot of them. And on top of that, there is uh, a bootstrap provider. We use KubeADM by default uh, because it's uh, what we what we work with, uh, and it is what will essentially prepare your nodes for being part of a Kubernetes cluster and uh, starting to serve workloads. So there's lots of benefits to Cluster API, as you might imagine. Uh, the first one being lifecycle management. Um, so kind of uh, redundant with the previous slide, as in very easy to deploy clusters, uh, scale your clusters. You can connection um, because being declarative, uh, working with manifest, you can store them in a Git repository. And this uh, Git repository will hold everything that is uh, describing your clusters. So inside your management cluster, you will have uh, GitOps operators. So that can be Flux CD or Argo CD, for instance. Um, that will pick up the changes in your Git repo and will apply them into the cluster. So, for instance, if you want to uh, change the number of replicas to your cluster to one of your worker clusters, you just you just make a commit to your uh, Git repo, change the uh, number of replicas, and that's it. Just wait a couple of minutes, and the operator will do it for you. So um, it's 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 very quick. So 
lease of provisioning comes with uh, your infrastructure, of course. Uh, some will be faster than, than others, but from experience, we found that it is really, really fast uh, to provision clusters. We do it in minutes. Um, and this is uh, kind of a breeze uh, compared to how it used to be before uh, manually provisioning all these, uh, these big clusters on premise. And the bootstrap flexibility, as I mentioned with the bootstrap provider, KubeADM, you can do lots of things with that. Um, you can add like system D units to your, to your VMs. You can add static routes. You can um, configure your HTTP proxy. Basically, you can do whatever you want as long as you can do it with KubeADM uh, commands or files, which Linux uh, thankfully lets you do very easily. And uh, probably the best thing about all is the standardized nature of cluster API. Um, it is now considered kind of the in industry standard. Uh, all the major companies are using it. We made the choice <clears throat> also to use it. Um, and the community is growing every day, which is, uh, which is great to see. So this was for the core KP, let's say. And then uh, comes the providers. So in our case, we're going to talk about uh, the providers for VMware Cloud Director and vSphere. So Cap VCD and Cap V, that's, that, that's what we call the, the kind of Cap V providers. Um, they are not interchangeable. So Cap V will work with vCenter. Uh, so provision all your infrastructure on vSphere and Cap VCD will interact with your vCD API endpoint. So the good thing is that if you are a VMware customer, you can already use Cluster API. Uh, we can already uh, address your environment because we have the providers to work with it. Um, this slide is uh, my favorite because it's a bit messy on purpose. Uh, so it is um, a list of the custom resources uh, that make up CAPI and the CAPI providers. So to the left, you can see um, the custom resources for cluster API, you have cluster objects, uh, you have the machine deployment, which kind of the equivalent of a pod deployment. You have the replica set, the machine set, then you have the pods and the machine. So sort of the same idea. Then you have description of your bootstrap process with kubeadm. Uh, you have configuration control plane for your uh, Kubernetes API. And then you have your provider specific custom resources. So in the case of VCD, they are called VCD cluster, VCD machine, VCD machine template. And same thing for vSphere, except you replace VCD with vSphere. Um, so in your VCD cluster object, you will have everything that is specific to your VCD environment, the API endpoints, so the URL, um, which uh, load balancer to use, which um, uh, credentials to use, all these things that are kind of uh, relative to the uh, actual data center, and then the VCD machines will be the actual virtual machines that you will deploy in your environment. So this uh, was cluster API and the providers in general, and now we have the giant swarm approach to cluster API. So how do we deploy clusters um, at giant swarm? So like I mentioned, there is the concept of management clusters and workload clusters. The management cluster is the, uh, the, the brain of the operations, and this is where we will install the custom resources. These custom resources we just saw will kick off the creation of the infrastructure resources. And um, in order to do that, we use our own app platform. So the app platform, we use it to install <clears throat> any apps you can think of, um, Nginx, Cert Manager, um, everything you can, you can dream about, basically. Uh, you, you install your apps with the configuration in the management cluster, and then they are installed automatically in the worker clusters for you. So they are managed from a single location, uh, which is pretty good to handle the lifecycle of the apps as well. Upgrades, um, changes in versions, rollbacks, all these things. So we use the same modus operandi for our clusters. We, um, we use an app for the cluster and the default apps. So um, there is a custom resource that is called the GenSwarm app. There's one for the cluster with a config map that will hold the cluster configuration. We will see that in a minute. 
And then there is one for the default apps, which is all the applications we want to install in all of our workload clusters. So everything that should be there out of the box, as in Cert Manager, Virtual Copilot Autoscaler, um, a bunch of exporters for observability. Um, so all of these things that, that should be there uh, regardless. So I'm just going to take a look at the cluster configuration because the default apps are usually just fine with the default sensible values. <clears throat> and um, on this slide, we are looking at a vSphere cluster, a CAPV cluster. So to the right, you have a few uh, properties. So one of them is the base domain. We have our own test domain, but customers will have their own. So they can access the API with their own, with their own uh, uh, domain name. Um, the organization is a genswarm construct to set boundaries uh, for our projects. Um, and to the, to the left, we have the connectivity side of things and the S configuration of the SSO. So this is where you would uh, configure the IP for the Kubernetes API endpoints, um, what load balance, the, the IP range for your load balancers in your worker clusters, you can do that from the management cluster in CAPV. Um, and then configure IDC so the customer can access the clusters with their own, um, um, with their own infrastructure. In this slide, we have the more like <clears throat> vSphere-like uh, configuration side of things, so control plane and worker nodes. So to the left, we can see the conf configuration for our uh, control plane nodes. So we have a number of three replicas, meaning this will be a highly available cluster. Uh, so the Cube API request will be load balancing between your three nodes, meaning that if you lose, for instance, one vSphere host, you will still have two VMs running. So your control plane, your Kubernetes API will still be available. You specify which network you want to connect these VMs to, uh, the resources, disk size, CPU, memory, you can configure all of that um, as you wish. And of course, we provide sensible defaults, so you don't have to change them, uh, but you might have to in case you want bigger clusters that will require uh, more resources uh, in the future maybe, but this can be changed at any time. And to the, to the right, we configure our worker nodes. So we, uh, we leverage the concept of node pools. So a node pool is a collection of nodes that have the same configuration, the same hardware configuration. So as you can see on this one, uh, the default node pool, we have 10 gig of uh, memory, six CPUs and a bunch of uh, disk. But you, can, you could have two or three or four different node pools for different applications, different workloads for our environment. Uh, you may want to do machine learning that will require more CPU. You may want to do caching that will require more RAM. You can do everything you want, basically, because you have full flexibility across your environments and over your node pools. Now, what happens when uh, you create a cluster? So um, things are a bit different between CAPV CD and CAPV because um, CAPV out of the box is a, this is a hypervisor platform with, without like um, uh, a load balancer embedded, but we do provide load balancing with kubevip so you can have high availability. But basically when you create your cluster, you deploy the load balancer resources. So then so pool, the virtual service uh, for your single point of ingress to your cluster, uh, the compute resources are deployed. So this is your VMs. Uh, they are created from the template that will, that you will have selected beforehand and the resources will be tuned like we saw, like we saw CPU, memory, disk, etc. Uh, and for VCD, all of that will be tied into a VApp, which is like the construct of your cluster in VCD. Once this is done, we know the IPs of all the, all the nodes. So we can update the load balancer pool with the IPs of the control planes. So that's when you hit the virtual service IP, you will be redirected to the correct uh, backend servers, which are our control plane nodes. After that, the VMs are bootstrapped using kubeadm. We install uh, the CNI, we use Cilium. 
the control the um, cloud provider sorry this will allow you to create service type load balancer the container storage interface for persistent volumes uh, core dns and also the kubevip provider for vSphere and once this is done you have a cluster that is essentially ready you can use it already um, but we still install our default apps uh, this is what this is why we have this extra uh, app and config map we deploy in the management cluster because we want to have all these um, applications running everywhere so we can have like visibility and control over the cluster so we can manage them for you so exporters and observability what you call product scaler, cert manager, and a bunch of other things. Now, when it, when it comes to GitOps, um, the great thing about GitOps is that it is mostly versioned and immutable. So you can track all the changes that have been done. You can roll back if something uh, um, unwanted happen, so you can go back in time. Uh, you can collaborate better with your uh, with your coworkers by using code reviews, pull requests. Um, that means good reliability, less chances of things going all right. Uh, deployment is, is made much faster because of all that. Uh, you just push your changes to your cluster, and then your GitOps operators in the cluster will apply all these changes. So basically what happens is that someone pushes a, a change to the Git repository, then Flux will pick up the new commit ID. It will apply the new resources in the management cluster. Cluster API will, will pick up these changes if they, if they are uh, on cluster API CRs, of course, and it will make the changes to the infrastructure provider. Um, and last but not least, um, just wanted to mention our hybrid platform. <clears throat> so like uh, Franz already mentioned, uh, GenSwarm, the platform is the same across the board, where, whether you're running on AWS, Azure, VCD, vSphere, OpenStack, etc., you will have the same experience uh, in terms of managing the environment, getting support from the company, observability, alerting, everything is the same. The only thing that will change, of course, is the provider specific things like you don't deploy a cluster in AWS the same way you do it in vSphere, of course. And this kind of leads me to the next thing about hybrid Kubernetes clusters. So now we can create management clusters in one cloud provider in order to manage worker clusters in different cloud providers. So in the example on shown on, on screen, you have a management cluster running in Microsoft Azure with workload clusters deployed in, in Microsoft Azure as well. And you can also deploy your clusters to vSphere. Um, so you, you will have your on-prem data centers. Um, Azure and your data centers will be linked with an IPsec tunnel, for instance. And from there, you can centralize your monitoring your alerting and all of these things that I talked about uh, just earlier. So now I just wanted to show a quick demo and to show you that uh, this is happening in the real world. Um, we, our, we have a customer, Telecom, Deutsche Telekom, that are currently running CapVCD in their environments. Um, one of the first uh, CapVCD customers, I would say. Uh, we were probably one of the first users as well and contributors also. Um, so in this environment, everything is managed by GitOps. Um, all the resources are stored in the GitLab repo that is uh, internal to the company. Uh, we trained, uh, we trained um, uh, the teams on Flux CD, um, uh, the GitOps, layout that we use, uh, all cluster API resources, etc. And so now they can easily collaborate together through, pull re through merge requests in uh, GitLab um, and really work efficiently. Uh, so they've been, they've been doing great work and uh, really expanding the, the, the platform uh, recently. Also working on this on the multi-site uh, data centers uh, to achieve disaster recovery across different VCD instances and, diff and uh, different sites. 
so you can sustain uh, failures of any sort, basically. All the, all the clusters are private. Uh, this is kind of a big thing because uh, they are not exposed to the internet, only accessible through VPN. Uh, internet access happens uh, via HTTP proxy. All things that are done by Giant Swarm in the bootstrapping process uh, with uh, our cluster apps that allow these possibilities. Um, earlier, I mentioned that we were one of the first contributors to Cap VCD. Uh, and a couple of things that we did were actually for this customer. So bottom left, we see Multinic and naming conventions. These are two things that we contributing, we contributed to the upstream projects. So now you are able to create clusters with like nodes that have that are connected to different networks instead of just one. Uh, you can specify a naming convention so the VMs are renamed and then you abide by a naming convention because of some automation going on in the background. Um, they have custom app catalogs um, for their own telecom apps. So th that way they can install uh, the apps that they develop using the Genswarm platform, meaning they are managed from the management cluster and stored in GitOps in a declarative way. SSO and secrets are like, secrets are encrypted and stored in GitOps, and SSO is configured on all the clusters across the board, so they can access them using their pipeline. So now I'm just going to show you around a little bit. Uh, let's see. Okay. So. Um, at the moment, we are looking at the GitOps repo, which is uh, in GitLab instance. Um, this is the actual environment uh, that Deutsche Telekom runs. So as you can see, uh, there are a number of folders and files. This is a layout that Genswarm uses for all their customers. Uh, this is something that is tried and tested. Uh, we run lots of customers like that. This is how we run our own clusters. We always um, uh, perform like dog fooding, we say, we install what we like, we preach what we, um, I forgot the, 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 the phrase, but uh, we do what we install with our customers. So if you take a look at the bases, this is everything that is like common to all the clusters. Uh, you can have 10 clusters, things that are in the bases will be distributed across the board to all the clusters. So. When I talked about the cluster app, this is what the cluster app looks like. So as you can see, um, there is a, a specific kind. Uh, so you can see application Genswarm. This is the app CRD for the app platform of Genswarm. Then we specify which catalog we want to use. We have a number of different catalogs that you can install from testing, playground, production, staging, etc. So this one is from the production cluster, uh, production catalog, sorry, of course. And then we have the name of the application we want to install. So it's the exact same um, mantra that we use for regular apps, not just clusters. And then we can take a look at the configuration of this cluster. So the values, again, we are in the basis. So this is kind of the, 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 the spine of the cluster that will be then uh, customized for each worker cluster. And then same thing for the apps. Um, we want to install a number of things uh, to all our clusters and they, they can be configured there. Um, same idea, you know, you have your app CR. Uh, in this case, we use a different catalog, which is Genswarm catalog, not the cluster one. And uh, the name of the app we're installing or back bootstrap uh, with a specific configuration. So once you have all these bases, um, we have specific configuration for the worker clusters. Now at the moment, they have three clusters, uh, testing, staging, and production. So if I take a look at the testing cluster, um, you can see you get pretty much the same uh, information we had before. We can choose version, version for the default apps, etc. And then when you get into customizing your cluster, you can 
do pretty much whatever you want. So in this case, for this uh, specific one, um, that's the, this is where you understand why we implemented the multi-nic feature. Uh, for instance, this cluster has six network cards connected. So the main one uh, that is connected to um, uh, the network where the Cube API will live, and then an extra five networks. And on top of these networks, we have a number of static routes. So because, you know, Telecom is a telco, they have lots of networks, and they needed to be able to uh, abide by all these um, uh, all these specifics uh, in the environment. And if you look at the node pool, we have 10 replicas here. Now, this is the testing cluster, but you don't need 10 replicas and so many networks everywhere. If you take a look at the production cluster, you will see that it's very much different. You, are, you have, well, four networks in this one, uh, different set of static routes and only six replicas. So if you wanted to, I don't know, increase the size of your cluster because you know that next week um, you are onboarding a new customer and you will need more horsepower. You just go ahead, you change your number of replicas from 6 to 15. Uh, you commit the change, so you collaborate with your colleagues uh, to create a merge request. Someone will approve it or not. Uh, and then this is how uh, you provision your change. Flux will pick it up with a new commit ID and the VMs will be automatically provisioned in your environment and your clusters will be 15 nodes instead of six um, in a matter of minutes. And of course, uh, same idea for the um, uh, applications. So I showed you the, uh, the, the cluster specifics, but you can also install your apps. In there you see Trivi is installed, the Nginx Ingress, NFS provisioner, number of things are already installed in this cluster. Um, so you can do that from the, the comfort of, of your Git repository and then the controllers will take care of everything for you. Now, the good thing about the Genswarm app platform is that you have all the Genswarm catalogs, but you can also install your own. And Deutsche Telekom does so. They have an extra four catalogs in here, you can see. Um, so their apps that they've developed uh, for their own purposes are stored in these four, these four catalogs. Um, so some are like probably this one, but these ones uh, are public. Uh, public catalogs because they want to have access to GitLab ch Helm charts, uh, Bitnami uh, registry. You can have um, your own catalog in which you will install your own apps using the Jane Swarm app platform. So you can manage everything from your GitOps repo and your management cluster. So now that we know what it looks like from the GitOps repo, Let's take a look in VCD to see what it uh, translates to in the infrastructure provider. So uh, we had a look at the testing cluster. We can see that there are 13 VMs um, and we saw 10 in the manifest. This is because we have 10 worker nodes and three control plane nodes. It is a highly available cluster, meaning you lose one control plane node, you still have two available. So you don't lose access to your Kubernetes API. Um, and of course, etcd is, is high available. We can see the different networks. Um, so um, as you can see, that's, that's, that's quite a few. There are our six networks that are connected to all the VMs. Um, so if I take one of the VMs, for instance, uh, they have the names that follow the naming convention uh, I mentioned, um, because they have some specific automation in the background to follow like inventory, um, reporting etc so if the vm doesn't follow that convention doesn't really work for them so this is why we implemented this feature um, and over there you find everything that is um, specific to your virtual machine and to the node pool and the node class that you configured in your manifests um, so for instance these ones these must be the control plane uh, 16 cpus um, 64 gigabits, gigabytes of RAM, uh, or maybe it's the workers. Uh, I can't remember which one it is. Um, but this this translates from the manifest that we set in the cluster um, config map. Also in the networking section, 
if we look at our edge gateway, which is kind of like the, the T1 router in the, um, in the NSXT lingo, there is, there are a lot of, uh, different load balancers in here because we have ingresses, we have Kubernetes APIs, uh, but the testing cluster, for instance, we take this one, we see that we have these three nodes, these three APs, sorry. These are our control plane nodes. So anything, when you try to hit using kubectl, you try to kubectl get pod, you will be redirected towards these, um, these three control plane nodes. And you have the same concept for the ingress controller, I'm going to take one uh, uh, arbitrary. Uh, you have the same idea for the ingress controller, except it will target the worker nodes. And only the ones that run an Nginx controller will be up um, in this example. So this, all, this is for the pool with your backend servers. And then you have the virtual services, which is the virtual IP. So you have a number of servers, pick up your cluster and the virtual IP is your uh, access point into this uh, collection of clusters of nodes, sorry. Um, so for instance, if we take a look at the testing cluster, uh, I believe it's, which one is it? Um, configured with IP ending with 88, 88, sure enough, the testing cluster is on IP uh, dot 88. And yeah, this is this is pretty much how the access to the cluster happens in the background. Uh, and of course, you also you also get the benefits of uh, of VMware Cloud Director in general um, when you create a PVC in your environment. Uh, we run the CSI, so the Container Storage Interface, in all our clusters. Um, a name disk, so uh, a virtual disk instance will be created in VCD in the environment. Um, and once it is attached to a pod in your infrastructure, it will be attached to a VM. Uh, it will be attached to, a, to the VM that runs the node that runs the pod. So um, the benefit of that is that it is completely native to VCD. There is no uh, intermediary layer, uh, we are completely native, uh, and you get the performances that the infrastructure gets. Uh, so uh, you can you get the best bang for your buck, basically. Um, and uh, same, same idea for vSphere, you know, um, you instead of getting named disk, you will get a uh, cloud native storage, it's called for vSphere, and you will get your persistent volumes that will be attached to the VMs. Um, so exact, exact same idea over there. Um, so I hope you, you learned a thing or two, uh, about, about Cap VCD and, uh, and how we do things. And now I'd like to give it back to, uh, Franz to wrap up the webinar. Yeah, thank you very much, Kevi, for giving us an introduction to that. And um, yeah, um, I hope uh, everyone was uh, quite uh, engaged in the session, uh, learned a lot, um, took away maybe some thoughts. Uh, we're looking forward to um, to you know, reaching out to us, either contact us at hello at giantswarm.io uh, or at uh, Kevi or Franz at giantswarm.io. So very, very much looking forward to learning what your thoughts are. Um, if you also have different viewpoints, um, please share them. Uh, we love interacting with our uh, prospects and customers and uh, yeah, and also friends. Uh, so we've got regular Giants Warm and Friends evenings uh, where um, customers uh, present uh, what uh, they've been working on and uh, we typically have different uh, stories from security to cost savings to, um, uh, yeah, maybe sometimes we, we learn about the businesses of the customers. So yeah, um, please reach out to us. Um, more happy to discuss and, um, yeah, would thank, like to thank you, Xavier, for taking us on a tour and, um, uh, yeah, looking forward to the next webinar. And, uh, yeah, if you are at, um, VMware Explore in Barcelona. Uh, we're looking forward to seeing you. We will definitely be there. Take care. All the best and see you. Bye-bye. Thank you. See you.